Well, let's pray together as we come to look at God's word together. Gracious Father, by your spirit, may you do what we've just been singing. And this morning, open the eyes of our very hearts that we may see you, that we may know you better. And as a result of meeting you again this morning, we may li live lives more faithful to you. Again, we thank you for this anniversary Sunday. We thank you as we saw those pictures of how you have been faithful to us as a fellowship and as individuals. And we pray that you would encourage us afresh this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Irene, and thank you, Anthony, and others for your welcome this morning. It's great to be here. When I was in Malawi a couple of weeks ago, um, on one occasion, traveling to the north, we visited the home of an elderly, godly Malawian lady called Alice, who I discovered amazingly had actually met in Edinburgh at the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland when she represented the Presbyterian Church there. And as we pulled up to her home on an almost undrivable uh, muddy road, um, we saw what seemed to be like uh, a simple, humble, Malawian, African home. It was small and it was neat. It had rough brick walls and a tin roof and an outside latrine, no running water, just little paint. But after a short conversation with Alice, she invited us into her garden. And to our utter amazement, we were led out into a huge space. And this was part of a little compound, a little village. Uh, we didn't know there was this space behind at all. It was park-like. It had exotic flowers, it had bushes, it had fruit trees, it had everything from bananas to apples to mango trees. It had a Scots pine growing there that my son-in-law's father had planted many years before and now was a full-grown tree. And at the centre of this lovely garden was an arch with the words, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. What we saw when we first drove up to this little African house was very, very different to what we experienced, a sort of veritable slice of the Garden of Eden when we got into her garden. And our theme and our question for this anniversary morning is this question. What do we see? And it is central to the passage that we've just read from Numbers 13 and 14. And again, if you have your Bible, perhaps you'd return to this passage. For many of us, I guess, it's a very familiar story. After all the drama of the Exodus, after the glory of receiving the Ten Commandments and the Covenant at Sinai, after the miracle of manna and quail and water from a rock in the wilderness, the Israelites are now poised on the very edge of the Promised Land. After years of longing and praying, after weeks of travelling from Egypt, they are now on the threshold of a whole new beginning. The land of Canaan, first promised to their forefather Abraham, is finally waiting to be claimed. It is their God-given inheritance that they are so close to enjoying. 
And you can imagine, can't you, that as they set up camp at a place called Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, known for its large, hospitable oasis, you can imagine the excitement and the anticipation and the hope growing as finally they come to the southern border of the land of Canaan. But as we read, God first commands Moses to send out 12 scouts to reconnoiter this promised land. One, as we read, from each of the 12 tribes. And they are duly named and duly recorded, um, as is typical of this book of Numbers. We never hear of any of them again, apart from Caleb and Joshua. But like good sleuths, they quietly cross the border and they fan out secretly to make their way from the far south way up to a place called Rehob in the far north. They have no James Bond gadgetry. They have no Google Earth. They have no satellite imaging. They have no radio contact, but they have keen eyes. What are the people like? How warlike are they? How well fortified are the cities? How productive is the land? The Israelites at Kadesh base camp can't wait for the results. And finally, after 40 days, the 12 return. And this fact-finding report is delivered. And it begins with a glowing report. The land is indeed rich and fertile, a land flowing with milk and honey. The land, the, uh, the, the valleys are exceedingly fertile. The soil is rich. Vineyards are plentiful, and two of the scouts have specimens to prove it. And that little image of these guys carrying the grapes on a pole is still the Israeli tourist board symbol today. For sure, there are challenges to be expected. It's hardly going to be a walk in the park. But the Israelites can't wait for the conclusion. But then something happens. Suddenly, the unanimity of these 12 spies breaks. Suddenly, 10 out of the 12 begin to look frightened. Actually, they say, there are giants in the land. And uh, we spotted some of our most feared enemies, the Amalekites and the Hittites and the Jebusites, and yes, the Amorites and the Canaanites. In fact, we're just like grasshoppers compared to them. And out pours this avalanche of negativity. Problem after problem after problem after problem. Until one lone voice can stand it no longer. And it is Caleb from Judah. And look what he says in verse 30. This is what he says. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. And later he's joined, if you look to chapter 14, verse 8, by Joshua, and together they say, if the Lord is pleased with us, he will take us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. The Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Notice the ten never once mentioned the Lord. Whereas for Caleb and Joshua, it is all about what God can do. In fact, if you look at the description in chapter 13, verse 2, the land which I am giving to the Israelites it is in sharp contrast with verse 27 when the 10 spies simply say to Moses, we went up to the land to which you sent us. No reference to God, no reference to gift, no reference to promise. 
I wonder if you can remember the famous words of that beautiful chapter, Isaiah 40. And those words that say, the Lord sits enthroned in the heavens and the people are like grasshoppers. But here the ten say, we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. So here's the question this anniversary morning. What do we see? In all honesty, what do we see as we look around us? Do we see a small church here in Dunfermline West struggling in survival mode? Do we look out across Fife and across Scotland and see a hopeless moral landscape, a highly secularized culture, irretrievably indifferent to the gospel? Do we see Dunfermline West as a fellowship with a few leaders and even fewer resources? What do we see this morning? Or do we see a gracious God who specializes in taking the weak things of this world to confound the strong? Do we see a God who never breaks his covenant promises and who constantly surprises his people with his gracious generosity? Do we this morning as we worship together see a risen, ascended Christ who is truly head of the church before whom even the gates of hell cannot prevail? What do we see? As Anthea and others decide on the theme of new beginnings for today, do you really see new beginnings? Well, this passage, I guess, above everything else, is a classic illustration of true faith. Biblical faith is viewing both our present and our future with God between us and our challenges. The ten spies were not weak or visionless people. Notice in verse 2, and it's repeated in verse 3, that they were specifically chosen as leaders of their tribe. They had experience. They were chosen for their courage, for their strategic thinking. And yet when it mattered most, they failed because God's sovereignty was not central to their vision. They saw giants and not God's greatness. They saw problems and not divine power. They saw danger and forgot the remarkable deliverance just a few weeks before they had experienced at the Red Sea. They saw themselves as grasshoppers, not the treasured covenant people that they truly were. Biblical faith is seeing God's tomorrow so clearly that it shapes our today. Now, before we move on, notice two things from this story about this true faith. First, biblical faith is never mere blind optimism. Sorry, I'll move back. It's never a sort of head in the sands thinking. We are called as a church, like those 12 spies, to honestly face our contemporary missionary challenges. We are called, like those 12 scouts, to do our fact-finding, to do our careful strategizing. What are the needs? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities of this five town where we live and serve? 
What are the things we need to change as a church in order for the gospel to be truly accessible and credible? Maybe that's a question you'll be asking at your annual meeting next week. What fresh and creative resources can we harness? There is homework that, like the 12 spies, we are meant to do. Faith is never just some sort of blind optimism. And second, biblical faith is never simply a matter of working ourselves up into some sort of religious state in order to believe a few unlikely things. Faith is not looking inwards. Faith is looking outwards to the objective trustworthiness of God. It has been well said that faith is not a leap into the dark. It is a steady walk into the light of who God is and what he has done. If you look down to chapter 13 and verse 22, you'll notice that the town of Hebron is specifically mentioned. And the picture of Hebron is on the screen. Hebron was the place where God first promised to Abraham that a land would be part of the covenant. It was in Hebron that Abraham acquired his only piece of real estate for the burial of his wife. And it was at Hebron that he and the other patriarchs were buried. Hebron would clearly remind the Israelites of the promise of land. God has promised us not land. God has promised us in Christ eternal life. God has promised us in Christ release from all that lurks in our past. God has promised us a peace that this world will never give. God has promised us in Christ all the resources that we need. This is the nature of true faith. Can you move me on? Thank you. In our Baptist history, I um, don't know if Anthony has encountered this character, there is a famous 19th century German pastor and missionary called Johann Onken, greatly revered in Europe among Baptists. Interestingly, his journey to faith began when he visited Scotland in the late 1820s and later converted in a Methodist church in London. He corresponded with some famous Baptists in Scotland called the Haldane Brothers and was convinced of Baptist principles. And early in the 1830s, he planted what was the first Baptist church in Germany, in Hamburg. He's known as the father of continental Baptists. But as a little congregation, not much bigger than the congregation here, a group of about 50 to 60 of them, they encountered enormous opposition from the strong Lutheran atmosphere of Hamburg. Indeed, the civic authorities began to make life very difficult for them. And at one point, the local chief of priests declared that he was determined to stamp out all Baptists in Hamburg, in the middle of the 1830s. And he told Onken this, as long as I can lift this little finger, you will feel the force of it, he said to Onken. But this is how Onken replied. Listen to what Onken said. He said to the police, I believe you do not see what I see. You only see your own arm. I see a greater arm and it is the arm of God. And so long as this arm moves, you will never silence us here. Isn't that a great statement from Johann Onken? 
in the 1830s. You do not see what I see, a greater arm, and as long as he supports us, we have nothing to fear. True faith is Elisha, if you remember the story at Dothan, totally surrounded by the Aramean army. But then he prays that his servant will see what he sees. The outlying hills full of the chariots of the Lord of hosts. Faith is like Hezekiah, who when the Assyrian king said he was going to pulverize Jerusalem, he lays the letter before the Lord and said, Lord, you look at this letter. I trust you for what is to come. Faith is Peter walking on water. And as long as his eyes are fixed on Jesus, he continues to walk. Faith is having God more in focus than our circumstances. I'm reminded of a great congregational preacher, P.T. Forsyth, who once said to his young ministerial students, you must live with people to know their problems, but you must live with God to solve them. The nature of true faith. But this dramatic passage is not just about the nature of true faith. It is about the importance of true faith. And here we need to listen up. Numbers 13 and 14 are wonderfully inspiring chapters, familiar, as I say, to many of us here. But they are also some of the most sobering chapters in the whole canon of Scripture. God's best for his people could have been enjoyed in a matter of days. Instead, what happened was that a whole generation were excluded from the promised land and they wandered in the desert for another 38 years. How tragic, how salutary. This was not yet another wilderness rebellion. In fact, it was the fourth rebellion in the story since they left Egypt. But this was a truly catastrophic moment. And of course, there's deep irony in this story. For the people who feared to enter Canaan and who began to moan to, jo to, to, to Moses and Aaron said they would rather die in the desert than experience what they were going to experience in Canaan. And the punishment comes out of their own mouth. For that is exactly what a whole generation experienced. And this sad moment of Numbers 13 and 14 becomes a great warning lesson in the rest of Scripture. It's there in Deuteronomy. It's there in the Psalms. And famously, it's there in the book of Hebrews. So, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did at the rebellion, this occasion. I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And a whole generation never enjoyed the promise of a land. Without faith, says the writer to the Hebrews, it is impossible to please God. I sometimes wonder how many churches today are wandering in a wilderness because when the moment of testing came, they did not believe. 
This summer, we are looking forward. Alan and Anne will be pleased to know, if I can show my picture, to going back to the Isle of Colonsay. Have you been to Colonsay yet, Rachel and Anthony? There's a Baptist manse there waiting for you for a wonderful holiday. It's a lovely, lovely Scottish island. And uh, if you've not been, it's well worth visiting. And I remember a story told many years ago to me about the hotelier. There's only one hotel on the island of Colonsay. About the hotelier on the Isle of Colonsay. And he happened to be visiting Glasgow. And for some reason, he suddenly became desperate to get back to the island of Colonsay. He didn't have time to catch the train to Oban, so being a guy who wasn't short of a bob or two, he caught a helicopter, believe it or not, from Glasgow Airport and privately flew to Oban, where he picked up, just in time, the last Calmac ferry across to Oban, three hours. <coughs> Such was the storm that night, that evening, <laughs> that when the Calmac ferry actually got to the pier at Colonsay, the captain concluded the swell was so dangerous they could not actually uh, link up with the pier. And they went all the way back to Oban, and the poor guy had to spend two more days in Oban. So near, and yet so far. Maybe you here this morning have never actually fully committed your life to Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord. Today is the day of salvation. Do not miss this moment. Do not harden your hearts, but enter into the rest of the salvation in Christ that is yours. Maybe as an individual, here you are as a church, declaring new beginnings. God is speaking to you about taking risks, about trying new things, about moving forward with a new pastor, and he calls you not to look at all the problems, not to have an avalanche of negativity, but to say with the Lord with us, we can enter into a new life, into a new period, into a new time for Dunfermline West. So what does it take to see correctly? What does it take to walk by faith and not simply by natural human sight? Some of you know the famous Oxford philosopher, Iris Murdoch, great novelist as well, who died in 1999. And although she was not a confessing Christian, far from it, one of her repeated themes in her philosophical writings and in her novels was that we actually live in a fantasy world, a world of illusion. And the moral life, she said, as a moral philosopher, is all about seeing correctly. Seeing the lies and the deceptions and the half-truths of our culture for what they are. And instead, in a phrase that she used to repeat, being attentive to reality. Attentive to reality. How are we attentive to reality? We are attentive to reality by first allowing worship to be more real 
than our worries. When we come to worship like this, it may seem a very familiar, regular, almost prosaic thing that we do. Sing a few songs, pray a few prayers, listen to scripture, hear somebody give a talk like I'm giving. But when we come to worship, we are opening ourselves up to being attentive to reality. Attentive to God, who is reality. Attentive to looking at the world in a different way. Attentive to understanding that we are not some self-constructed individuals who decide our own gender and decide our own agenda. But we are dependent creatures on a creator who made us in his image and who made us for his glory and who made us to trust him. Secondly, we see a right, not only when our worship is more important than our than our worries. But if it can come up the next one, thanks, Finn. We see a right when God's promises are more in focus than our problems. And as we read God's word, as we meditate on God's word, as we let God's word dwell in its riches, and maybe one of the new beginnings for us as a church is to engage even more closely with Scripture, then this truth, reality, renews our mind. It was precisely because Caleb and Joshua knew what God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they could say, do not be afraid of the people of this land because they will swallow them us up. Their protection is gone. The Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. It was because of the covenant promise that they said these things. And finally, Finn, if we could put it up, we see a right when we allow God's spirit of love to cast out our fear. Two weeks ago in Malawi, hiring a car, we drove 500 miles north, and believe it or not, we were stopped 14 times by the police. Uh, intimidating us, hungry for bribes. It's a corrupt, sad country as well as a beautiful country. And we prayed, Lord, help us to negotiate the police as we travel north. And uh, we developed all sorts of ploys, including, because it's a fairly Christian country, asking them what their favorite Bible verses were and their favorite Premier League football team were, and all sorts of distraction tactics. But God, in his grace, answered our prayer. And uh, they could have been as intimidating as the Nephilim and the descendants of Anak. But with God's help, we got through safely. As we invite God's spirit of love, to cast out what for some of us is real, fear, fear of change, fear of doing something different, fear of God taking us beyond our comfort zones. As we invite this morning God's spirit of love, it's God's spirit who brings faith because it's God's spirit who brings Jesus into focus. So as we come now to communion, let me ask you again, what do you see? Do you see giants? Do you see an impregnable wall as we try and witness and it always seems to rebound? Do we see ourselves as the equivalent of insignificant grasshoppers? Just a small group of us here in a small Baptist church. Or do we this morning, as we come to communion, see Christ crucified, risen, ascended, present among us here by his Spirit this morning?
Do we see that banner that is written over our lives? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Do we hear the words that Caleb said? The Lord is with us. So do not be afraid. Amen. So let's take a moment and let's have a quiet moment of prayer before we sing and before we come to communion. Let's pray together. And listen to this lovely prayer echoed in the song we sang earlier of the Apostle Paul. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Lord Jesus Christ, as we come to share in the meal that you instituted, may this prayer be answered among us this morning, that in a new way, we may see and be attentive to reality. We worship you, that you sit on the throne of the universe, that you have incomparable power and extraordinary love towards us. May we, in a new way this morning, find fresh dignity and hope and joy as we look to a new year of service and mission. We invite you by your Spirit to fill our lives afresh this morning, to fill our lives with your love that casts out fear, and to trust you as we've never trusted you before for what you have in store for us here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.